Hello, and my name is Pete Rushmer, and I'm your host today of A Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success, or you're already smashing it, but want to continue to level up, we are here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS, and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Uh, no, actually, most of the stuff that I needed to do today, I've done. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm needing to get a hell of a lot better with my time. Amazing. Well, the red light's rolling, mate. So you're like straight in there, no fucking around. We're like on it. Straight we don't, on even, the have, we don't even have war- we don't even have a warm up. No warm up, mate. I don't even do any foreplay, nothing like that. We just crack straight on, so. You're one of those. You're one of those guys. That's me, right? No messing. Straight in. <laughs> How do you feel about that? We're probably about halfway through when the recording should have happened. So I want to welcome the audience to probably the most rearranged podcast ever. Was only did tw- you, did, was only did you rearrange first time? Oh, was it once? I thought you'd rearranged one to be fair, but maybe no. I'm just like getting confused. No, I think that was, I think the original date I couldn't do. So we did another one and then That's you it. couldn't do that one. And then here we are late. Yeah. So we, we, were, we were due to record at like four o'clock and uh, I rung Sam at like four o'clock going, I'm stuck near Stanford on the A1 southbound. Can we rearrange? And then it cleared magically, and we're about 20 minutes late. So uh, what have you got to get off for, mate? What have you got? Anything? Uh, just the child will be coming home any time between now and the next 40 minutes. So I'll warn people now that if there's some screeching and some loud banging, then that's my feral two-year-old running around the house like a loose cannon. Don't sweat it, mate. Don't sweat it at all. My lad's going to be in the other room on Fortnite any minute, shouting at his mate. So <laughs> yes. I've got, I've told him he's got to be quiet because I planned to do this at the office, but I came, I came back and is that when the uh, is that when the Wi Fi the Wi Fi bandwidth just dips because he's, uh, he's, yeah. he's yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly that because he's mining Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 so yeah uh cool cool so who are you uh i've got sam on the call uh for the listeners i've got sam sam neil what a legend proprietor and owner of orchard safety limited um it's health and safety professional thing, aficionado uh, um you know uh chartered member of iosh although he doesn't use the post nominals no no we need to talk about that. That's something for the podcast. Do you know what? I don't even know what's on the agenda. I let you organise the agenda, and I don't even know what it is. So uh, that'll be interesting. So you're so yeah, that will be interesting. So so Lu- Pete's loose agenda was safety culture and the pitfalls. Now, for any safety professional listening, they will immediately go, "Fuck, that's a big subject to talk about." Uh, Christ Almighty. <laughs> And that is a very loose agenda. So you may have to bear with us because we'll probably disappear down a few rabbit holes. I reckon that'll be amazing. I'm all up for that. But for, first of all, mate, like give people a bit of an intro and you're like local to me or were local to me, not now not so local to me. Yeah. So people local to me will know that you were originally a Huntingdon boy, right? Uh, yeah, I was a Huntingdon boy. Yeah, moved there when I when I moved to a, a little village called Alcrimby Weston when I was, I think I was about two. So my family originally from Birmingham, we moved over that way, don't, don't ask me why. Um, and then moved to Huntingdon, because I went to St. Peter's. Uh, we moved to Huntingdon when I was, I think 11 or 12, and then I stayed there till I was 18. Yeah, you survived it, which was good. Yeah, I survived it. Is it, surviving, yeah. it is surviving at St. Peter's. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's got any better either, to be honest, but I, should, I probably shouldn't say that, should I? Um, no, yeah, I survived. Okay, mate. We'll, we'll, we'll all get shot up. So I've never been to St. Peter's, right? So I've never been. I know like, well, I was meant to be letting you do an intro and all that, and you can in a minute, but St. Peter's is like, I don't know. Like When I was growing up, obviously I grew up a little bit further south, probably a little bit further away in Cambridge. <laughs> And like St. Peter's, like I, I guess because my dad was policing at HQ in Hinchinbrook, like 
We, uh, I okay. always sold like I always sold like Oxmoor really really rough, right? So you, you've got like Oxmoor really really rough, and everyone from Oxmoor fed into St Peter's. Is that how it was, or have I been jaded? Is that no, not really how it is? St Peter's was the I think the Oxmoor was one of the main catchment areas for for St Peter's, but no, I wouldn't. I used to knock around in the Oxmoor. That's where most of my friends I went to school with lived. Where I had a couple of mates who lived in Stukeley Meadows as well. I wouldn't and say it was really rough what, I that, mean, obviously... what, what, that, what that means is not only a Sam a health and safety professional he, it also means he can look after himself <laughs> no I was just really quick <laughs> I was just off mate I never used to hang around <laughs> amazing amazing so give yourself go on give yourself a little bit of an intro mate go on tell, tell the listeners who Sam is so um, yeah so as Pete said I'm Sam Neil. I run a, a health and safety consultancy called Orchard Safety Limited, Limited uh, based in the East Midlands now but we we sort of travel everywhere um, kind of service the whole of the UK um, predominantly working with organisations a bit, bit twofold really we do we do sort of transactional stuff so companies got a problem um, they've had an audit or whatever they've had a few things identified and they just need someone to come in and, and sort of take that off their plate um uh, and then we do the, the sort of ongoing support of organizations that don't have an internal competent person um and then some of the more transformational stuff so sort of safety leadership workshops uh, working with organizational leaders to sort of identify how they can use culture if you like um to improve health and safety performance across the across the business so um Working a majority, a, a, a wide variety of industries. So I bounced around a lot in my career and um, did a bit of retail, a bit of distribution, logistics, fulfillment, uh, manufacturing. Um, and we sort of help those. We work with those organisations now. So um, it's kind of a wide, wide variety of issues and problems that we deal with, but keeps me busy and we uh, we have a lot of fun along the way. Nice. And like, so you grew up going, I want to be a health and safety professional, mum and dad, please. Doesn't, doesn't everybody? Is that, <laughs> uh, is that, is that how it Said was? no one. Said no one ever. <laughs> no one um, ever, exactly. No, I went to, so I, I went to university in Birmingham. So I, I went back to, to where I was born, I went to university there, came out of university with a degree and just went, right, uh, Cool. What do I what what do I do? What do I do now? Um, and then uh, got a job for with the Royal Royal Society for the Prevention Prevention of Accidents, ROSPA. Um, so they're quite yeah. quite well known in, in the health and safety industry. I, I got a job in their sales team selling health and safety training courses. Did my knee bosh whilst I was there, um, then started doing a bit of consultancy and 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 away. Away I went. So I, I, put, I first started in leisure safety, so sort of working with local authorities and open water um, bodies that have got leisure centres, that kind of thing. Um, and then oh, thought I needed to kind of cut my teeth as a as a, a direct or an internal health and safety professional. So then went went into uh, into a health and safety advisor's role and worked myself up, worked my way up. Love that, mate. Love that. So. What was your degree in? I, I noticed she said I got a degree. Like I, I Chris, got a degree. I got a degree in leisure and recreation management, which is which is sort of business a business management degree, if you like, but with a a, a focus on the leisure and recreation industry. Um, I don't think they even do it anymore. <laughs> to be honest. Why, why did you Why did you pick that then? Why did you pick that? Um. I wanted initially my because uh, it was really easy to get into. No, um, initially my uh, I wanted to get into sort of sports development, sports coaching, um, that that kind of thing. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it just didn't work out. It, yeah, well, I don't. What's, I think, what's your sport? What's your sport? What's your what's your sport of choice? Bit bit of everything to be honest. Um, so I played um, I played rugby. At, uh, Decentish level. I used to play for Hunting and Stags um, before I went to university. Um, played football. Um, played for Huntingdon and uh, and the mighty Rowdies. Anybody from Huntingdon will know what Rowdies who Rowdies are. Um, yeah, they were the Rowdies. Jeez. Um, and um, and then sort of now I just do. I don't really play any team sport. I'm just a bit of a CrossFit geek, um, albeit not very good at it to to be honest. So um, yeah, any sport really. I've I've tried. I've attempted. 
you do yourself down, mate. I I met Sam for the first time. We, we were like online online associate type people from from uh, from uh, as a byproduct of COVID, I suppose. But we met for the first time the other week, didn't we? Yeah, Sam, we did. Sam's, Sam, Sam's a beast, guys. Sam's a beast. Don't don't let him sit there like you know he could be five and a half foot tall for all you know, but he's not. He's a good six foot and a bit. And you and your and your Peter was answered to Popeye Pete after uh, after putting that t-shirt on. Don't know where you're hiding those guns, mate. But my God, they came out. I don't know what you're talking about, mate. <laughs> with 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 all the fat that comes with them as well. If you can't um, find Pete, he's normally in the gym by the sounds of things. I enjoy a bit of the gym, mate. I do enjoy a bit of the gym. I enjoy a bit of football too. I'm. Uh, I'm a bit bit shit these days, eh? A bit slow, a bit old and slow. Old age, mate. Old age and exactly. running a business will do that to you, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, let's do a little bit about your business then. So, how long have you been doing that, and how have you found it? Tell me about um, tell me about the trials and tribulations of Orchard Safety. Trials and tribulations. Uh, so we 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 oh, just over a year old now. So I started the business July 2021. Um, and I went full time December 2021. So um, the business is just a year old. I've been doing it full time for about for about 10 months. Um, the trials and tribulations tend to happen daily, weekly, monthly, um, as, as they do with hourly. hourly, as they do with running a business. Um, but um, in, 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 in whole, it's been really good. I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. I've, I've had to learn a lot of new skills um, I've had to actually use some of my degree, um, which has been quite nice, considering it cost me quite a considerable amount of money. Um, and um, I, I, um, I'm now at that stage where I'm starting to really help organisations sort of understand how to manage safety better. better. I don't know whether that's the right way of, of, of sort of articulating that. Uh, but we're starting to work with organisations and, and sort of meet the values of why I wanted to start the business in the, in the first place. I've done it. I've been in safety now for 16 years. Um, I've, I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, I mean, I, I've been involved in the good, the bad and the ugly. I've got it wrong. Um, so I, I've got a good understanding of, of what does work and what doesn't work and, and what can provide the, the best results. And I've just applied that to my, to my consultancy, you know, organizations that have got a problem. They're not seeing the results that they wanted to see. Um, can you come in as a bit of a third pair of eyes and and, and help us and steer us in the right direction, um, which has been great. I, I do a lot of training, um, which I love. That's probably one of the things that I, I enjoy the most about our job is we do get to throw a hat in the training ring every now and then um, and seeing that light bulb moment or people there thinking, actually, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. We've not been doing it the way that we should have been doing it or actually is a better way of doing it. Those are the bits that I really enjoy. Um, and, um, yeah, the training starting to take off now, which is good. Um, tribulations, I mean, yeah, where do you want us? There's some things I've got right. Some things I've got terribly wrong, um, you know, with the things that you don't necessarily do as a safety professional when you're running a business, invoicing and proposals and planning and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but, you know, every day is a school day, isn't it? And I'm, I'm, I'm loving learning new skills. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a real mixed bag of skill sets, isn't it, to be able to do it effectively. You've got to be. You've got to not only be good at doing the doing, you've got to be good at all the other stuff as well. Haven't you? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big old thing, isn't it? It's a big old thing, mate. And, okay, so whilst I'm on it, and before I forget, before we go off onto culture, because I will forget, why do you choose not to use your post-nominals? Because that's a big thing. That's a bit of a bit of a big debate, isn't it? And uh, I use mine, but I'm thinking more and more about dropping them. So why should I drop them? Um... I don't necessarily think you should drop them if you if you don't think you should. I think that's a completely it's a completely personal decision. Um, I just I don't I like people to judge me for what I can do rather than the letters I've got after my name. Mm -hmm. So and I know that doesn't work necessarily on face value because if you've never worked with me or you've never met me before, you won't necessarily know that I am char a charter member of IOSH, but. Um, you know, a lot of the organisations that I work with, it doesn't really mean an awful lot to them because they're not in the health and safety domain. 
Um, and a lot of the people that I do work with in a health and safety professional capacity, they know me and they know that I'm, I'm, I kind of know, I sort of know what I'm talking about and, and, and I do work to a, to a good level of standard. Um, so I don't need to, I don't need to rely on the fact that I'm chartered member to, to sort of demonstrate that I am a good safety professional. God, I'm blowing my own trumpet. I hate this. Um, to make yeah i don't uh, i hate talking about myself in a good light i don't know why um so i think i think if you you know it, i think the one the, the thing that gets lost in translation sometimes is actually the journey to chartered members isn't particularly easy you'll know this won't you pete um, yeah i'm on, on with it myself on yes. my own journey yeah on with and, it. and it's not it's nice if people get back to you about the evidence you submit for it that's that's yeah. always a good start touché, isn't it? mate touché yeah fair play <laughs> um the you know it's not it's not it's very it's time consuming and a lot of the routes that people go through are, are a challenge i remember doing the diploma the nebosh diploma and literally put my life on hold for 18 months it was it was that involved to to get the study doing to get the job done uh, and get the the get ready for the exams all at the same time so i understand why people use their post nominals because it, it you know it is a badge to show that people have jump through many hopes they've got to a certain standard in their career and fair play to them you know I, I would never hold it against someone that used post nominals if they wanted to i just choose not to because i would prefer people to sort of judge me on who i am and what the work that i do rather than the fact that i've i've got chartered status it's interesting it is interesting it's an interesting thing and uh i'm disappointed i missed the project Miletium uh discussion on post nominals to be fair because i did i did miss it and it was a it was a thing and uh there are there are a lot of people out there who choose not to use them and i think it's uh it, it does make me chuckle because so i'm a chartered member of the institute of logistics and transport yeah and it's read c milk which um could if like you get a little bit dyslexic can read something else and uh, there's a bit of banter about people getting uh, that thing that it could be and um yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's made me it's made me uh it's made me sort of reflect on it but i would get it regardless of the post nominals if that makes it uh, regardless of using the letters if that makes sense so one of my goals was to get chartered i off status by the end of this year but it's been delayed a little bit like you say uh, sam's been helping or i reached out when i got my grad iosh from doing my diploma i uh i reached out to get a mentor because the iosh it's not an easy process is it going from grad iosh to chartered or if you're new to it it can seem a bit complicated yeah. and you're not quite sure what that criteria is so you can get a mentor anyway they sent me a list of this link with all the mentors and i was like sam neil i know that guy so I was like, <laughs> he can be my he can be my mentor for that so yeah i appreciate you giving up your time for that do you so do you enjoy do you, do you have many people that you mentor yeah. for it and do you enjoy doing that yeah yeah i love it i love it uh, it's um it, as cliche as it sounds you know seeing other people thrive and succeed is 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 reward enough so i've um i've had uh quite a few people work for me in the past that have gone through the chartered route and have I've done their skills development portfolio, peer review interview, and then got chartered. Um, I've mentored a guy recently um, who's just got his chartered status as well. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite an arduous process to go through, like you're probably finding now and using the online system and finding the evidence of submitting that up into this, to the system. And then you get your feedback and then you have to sort of make some amends. So it's nice just to to know that I've been through all that and and, and I'm there just to people to bounce some ideas off. You know, is this going to work? How? You know, what do I need to do for in in this particular instance? And can you give me your thoughts on this before I submit it? Um, and then I, I I sit on the peer review panel. So I'm a uh, when you you get through to that stage and you get quizzed by three panel members. I'm one of those. So it's kind of nice to try and help people prepare themselves for that process as well. Oh, nice. You didn't you didn't let on that you were going to be one of the people doing the grilling as well, mate. You kept that one under your hat. Well, I I uh, I, I I wouldn't be able to do yours, Pete, because I've mentored you and uh, and sort of push ah. you in that and push you in that direction. Um, but but you know, I would certainly help you get ready for the for the interview as best as I can. I oh, appreciate that, mate. Sweet, sweet. Right, okay. So. We've skirted around. We've been on the call for like 20 minutes, chatting some shit and that kind of thing. Yep. 
now everyone's tuned in for one reason only, Sam. What is culture? Yeah. <laughs> have you got have you got a harder question I can answer, Pete? No? What is culture? <laughs> is that what people have really tuned that in was, for? Today? That was that was brutal, wasn't it? That was <laughs> absolutely brutal. Oh, you, can I, is it all right if I go and get a dictionary? Here I am. Do you know what? That's a great shout, isn't it? What quickly, is culture? Quickly sticking in what is culture in Google on my other computer. Um, th- mate, that's, no, that, no, is, no, that is a question go. in our... It's a good question, it though. Is, it is, it a, is good a good question. question. And it's one, it is a good question. It's one that... Um, it's one that safety professionals get asked or, or, or told to sort of look at quite often. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, in, in preparation for this call, because I like to prepare for these things, if you go on Google and you just type in what is a safety culture, the amount of information you get back is, is quite scary. And the more challenging aspect of that is that all the answers are slightly different. Absolutely, yeah. Can I give my answer? Because I, I, I think I think I've got a fairly well formed idea of what I think culture is in a safe. So I believe, and I, I might be way off the market, but in my head, culture is the practices and customs of a set group of people in a certain environment, and the way that things are done around here is is kind of the quote that I tend to. If someone asks me when I go and speak to them about a business, to me, that's what it is. But I also know, like you say, very clearly, that's my interpretation of something that is really very complex and yeah. indiv- individual to each person you speak to, I think, as well. Yeah. Which is why it's so complex. And I think I think in its in its sort of simplest form, it gets it, that's how it gets described, is you know, the way things get done around here when no one's looking. That's that's in its mm. simplest form, but obviously that in itself has loads of different connotations and loads of different um, sort of dynamic elements added into it. Um, you know, really, sort of my way of looking at it would be it's a collection of beliefs and and, and values and and opinions and perceptions, um, because you'll you'll get you'll get, and this is a pitfall that I'm sort of leaning into. You'll get cultures within cultures within cultures. So if you're mm. if you're a you know if you're a, a an organisation that spans the UK, you'll get cultures in the north that are very different to cultures in the south, um, mm-hmm. and that's where that's where people sort of tie themselves up up in knots because the way things are done around here when no one's looking is then very different depending on where what site you're at, what part of the world you're at, uh, what kind mm. um, uh, the the sort of demographics of your your workforce. Um, so it. It's so multifaceted. It's it's a it's a huge huge question, um, and one you know the other question is, is there such thing as a safety culture? Is it separate to the culture of the organisation? Um, you know, you're you're a, you're a business owner. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to ask the podcast host the questions, but I'm going to do it anyway. Go for it. Um, yeah, go for it, mate. Do you? Do you so let's do it. Do you believe? Do you think you have a a, a culture? For an organization and then do you think the safety culture within your business sits external to that does it does it sit in its own sort of little silo or do you want them together got you so for my organization as in flagship partners i know that there is a culture i know so the things i know are and and ultimately this is going to get very philosophical because ultimately i know i know nothing Um, but I know there is a culture. I know that as a leader, I attempt to influence the culture because I have a vision for the business and I have values and I've documented them. Have I documented them to the depth that I would recommend a larger company with like multiple depots? Uh, Have I documented them to that level of detail? Probably not. Mm. Have I done enough training with the team to develop them around the behaviors that I want around those values, potentially not. But so our vision, our values, and the culture that I'm attempting to build in the business, there is a long way to go. There's a long journey to go with the people in the business. But I do, I I think, I believe I take proportionate action to the size of the business and the number of the people to 
uh, ensure that the values are known and embedded within the team and that the right behaviours are rewarded. So we do a number of things to reward yeah. the right behaviours, if that makes sense. So I feel I do... I feel I do take a leadership role, but do I beat myself up sometimes when things go wrong? And I think that's my bad and I like take responsibility for it and probably more than my share of the responsibility. Then yeah, yeah, I probably do. Mm. Because everything that goes wrong, I go, I could have avoided that if I'd been a bit clearer with my communication. So all the time I'm working on that thing, but I guess it's hard like when you're a small business as well because like you're trying to shape and mold those things but you've got the day job to do as well it's yeah it's it's, it's complex isn't it it's complex yeah, yeah it's really did it's I really answer that question or did i just skirt yeah. around it a little no, bit no no th- well no you skirted around it um but, okay. but i think but i think in the same way <laughs> what was the question then go so on, go back. The, what was the question so the question I, was i hate being a politician whether 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 a safety culture sits whether a safety culture exists so is it is is it its own separate sort of entity or does it exist within the overall culture of the organization? I believe safety culture is part of the overall organization. Yeah, and, and I'd agree not, with you. And it's not separate. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with you. I'd agree with you. And that because the problem you've got then is if it sits separate to the 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 drumbeat of the organization and it just gets cut off whenever people don't want to yeah. sort of stick in tune with the with the with the safety culture um so yeah there you go you did answer the question well done mate thanks mate i could have done it a lot quicker as well with that with a bit little less of the waffle but i think but i think that's that it's a it's an interesting sort of insight into the the nuances of culture because you're only a small organization but already there are complications there's complexity in the culture you know you can you imagine looking at this from a you know massive organization that's got thousands of employees throughout the uk um i i wouldn't even know where to i wouldn't even know where to begin to a certain degree that'll be you in like so, 10 years time pete so you might as well get yourself sorted now oh right yeah world domination i ought to get my messaging right can you help me sam yeah of course can yeah <laughs> competitive day rates um, <laughs> love it um Mate, so okay, so we've we've talked about culture then. So tell me about tell me about when you have influenced culture in one of your previous. Right, that sounds like a job interview question. That doesn't it? I didn't mean that to sound like a job interview tell question. Me tell me, tell me, tell me about a time when you've influenced safety culture. Or well, are we are we going safety culture? Or are we going culture? See, that's well, a question, isn't it? Yeah. Are we going safety culture? Culture? Yeah. Or are they the same thing? Well, we can, Should we just? I, I think we can use the term safety culture because then we know that it's it's sort of reference to what we're I guess feel comfortable yeah, yeah. talking about because we work in that yeah. safe space, don't we? And so um just, just so I can qualify that quickly as well for the transporty people who are listening, because there's a lot of transporty fleet type people. When we talk about safety culture, you can insert the terminology we use in transport like compliance, culture, or anything like that. Essentially, you know, we're talking about the same thing when we talk about that. It's about what are your people doing when people aren't looking or when you're not looking as a manager or, you know, what are those things? So, sorry, yeah, carry on. I just wanted sorry. to make sure that people people knew we were talking relevantly about them because ultimately insert insert here, whether it's safety culture or yeah. um, what have you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. So there's, there's two, two particular um, uh, scenarios if you like or situations that, that that come to mind very quickly when me being sort of direct internal health and safety professional so one was when i went into an organization and there was a very very evident negative attachment to safety which was having an impact on on the culture of the the part of the organization that i looked after so you know if um if a particular site had more accidents one week, they'd be on the naughty boys, naughty girls list. Um, and all of a sudden, the directors would be focusing on them, right, what are you going to do to reduce your accidents and incidents? You know, you're not doing very well, you're not managing it properly, so on and so forth. And then the safety team would be parachuted in and they'd be doing audits and inspections. And it just it just didn't, didn't feel right at all. And actually what that did 
is it just pushed all the all the health and safety on the ground. You know, people weren't willing to be open and honest and transparent around their health and safety performance because they knew that if they were going to have more accidents than other sites, they'd end up getting a bit of a battering for it. Um, so all I did is I went, I, I didn't even really do an awful lot. I just went into to the organisation, looked at the way that they used the statistics um, and, and stopped the negative attachment. So we started looking at it from a more positive perspective. So, you know, if someone had an, an increased level of accidents, it wasn't, oh, you've had an increased level of accidents. It was, OK, what have we learned? What have we identified? What's not working? What do we need to do more? And then we use that, inf that information and drop that into all the other sites. Um, and you can you can do that, you know, whether you're in health and safety, whether you're in marketing, whether you're in the transport industry and finance um, is to to use these opportunities, these events, if you like. We don't we don't want these events to happen, but they do because we shit happens. It's life, unfortunately. Um, and we can use those events to learn. And then we use the learnings to prevent reoccurrences at other sites and other operations. And, you know, the, the same can be said for the transport industry. I've. I've never really worked directly with 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 transport, but because of my distribution and logistics background, I've always sort of been quite pally with transport managers. And and hi, it's Pete from Flagship Partners. We're proud to sponsor a half dozen things podcast. Flagship Partners help their clients become safer, greener, and greater through a range of consultancy and training services. We offer audits through to risk assessments, contracts through to support with managing your culture, all the way from mandatory training through to management training as well. So if you need any support, please do get in touch with Flagship Partners today. Trying to get them bought into that culture as well as, as, as sort of worked because when things happen, rather than jumping up and down and trying to blame an individual or using it as a negative attachment, they go, OK, cool. Right. Let's just look at this as an opportunity to learn for us to test the systems and do things slightly differently. So that was one. The other one um, was um, I'm trying to was was it wasn't actually so much me um, changing the culture. It was actually me being exposed to a very, very different culture. And I'm I'm it wasn't a particularly easy time and i'll come into why well some people might listening might know but um i went to work for an organization um called bunnings so they're a, they're a massive australian company um who predominantly just based in australia um they bought our home base so they came over to the uk and wanted to bring their operate operating model and the way that they serve customers over to to the uk um, and I went into work as Bunnings predominantly because I'd heard that their culture, their health and safety culture was very, very forward thinking. It was all based on trust and leadership and building uh, building an environment based around sort of psychological safety. So giving people the confidence in the environment to speak up and shout up and sort of employees managing their own safety to a certain degree. Um, and it was completely different to anything that I'd experienced before. And it was quite eye, quite eye-opening in, in some respects. And I'll always remember um, uh, a guy um, had quite a serious incident. He was using the wrong knife to open up a, um, some product that had come into one of the stores um, and slipped and cut his hand um, yeah. quite badly. Um, luck, he just, he just got the wrong part of his arm. Um, and um, big investigation was done because, because of the severity of the injury. Um, uh, we put in loads of raft of remedial control measures. But the, what was quite, so there was two things that were quite amazing is one, we got the team to do the investigation. So the safety team didn't swarm into the store and start pointing fingers. It was very much, a, we just want to learn what's happened so that we can share what's happened with other stores. And then I sat at my desk one day just reading the um, just reading the report and the managing director came up to my desk. So he, he'd come over from Australia, come up to my desk and he just said, he just said, hi, Sam, how you doing? And I turned around and I was like, oh, shit, um, because, you know, I don't know about people listening now, but in the UK, normally when the MD turns up at your desk, something's, you know, gone a little bit wrong. Um, I remember looking up thinking, oh, God, um, and then thinking, shit, how does he know my name? Like, OK, this is all very weird. And he just he just said, look, um, I've just come over to ask how Joe Bloggs was, who had the incident. Um, has anyone phoned him to see how he's doing? And I instantly went, Christ, like I've never he knew his name. 
He knew what story he was working in. He knew the extent of the injury, and he wanted to know if someone had contacted him to make he was make sure he was all right. No blame. No blame. No, this guy's an idiot because he's made a mistake. You know, no, have we got rid of him because he's made a mistake? Just is he all right? And have we learned from it? Some other team members don't get hurt. And I was like, wow, that's completely different to to anything that I've ever known before. And it was these kind of things, those kind of experiences, particularly when I was at Bunnings, that made got me very interested in in sort of these more progressive, more forward thinking, more proactive safety cultures, if you like. Um, and it's those those two things that have had sort of a one that I've been involved in that had quite a profound effect and one that happened to me that's been um it's been quite instrumental really at how I look at safety. That's incredible that that uh that MD of a huge company in Australia who bought Homebase, which is a huge company in the UK, has come yep. over, knows your name, someone who's cut their hand, yep. knows their name and wants yep. to know that they've been called and has made the point of coming over and finding out about it. Yep. It's incredible, isn't it? It was, yeah. And, it, and, it, and uh, I remember turning around to a guy called Benny um, who um, who had come over from New Zealand. He worked for, for Bunnings. Um, and I was like, is that... Does that always happen? He's like, yeah, yeah. Over in Australia and New Zealand, if someone gets hurt, he might. The MD is normally the first person to ask if if they're okay and what are we going to do to learn from the incident to make sure no one gets hurt again. And I, I remember just being completely shocked because I'd never. Now this might I might be speaking out of turn. This might happen in loads of organisations in the UK. I can only speak from experience of the ones that I have, but I'd never experienced that before at all. And it was it was a completely new, different way of doing things, um, and and it I just yeah I loved it. I just thought it was a completely new take, and it was what safety should be all about. You know, someone's got hurt. We need to make sure they're okay, and then we need to make sure that we're identifying ways that you know we stop this from happening again. It's not about going after the individual that's hurt themselves. It's just about you know was the system in place good enough? Did we have the right equipment? Did we have enough enough resource, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great, and I've I've never forgotten that. Never forgotten that. That's uh, that's blown my brains because my experience has generally been, and I generalise a little bit here, but generally speaking, it would be along the lines of. When's that guy who cut his hand open? When's he coming back to work? When's he going to be back? Um, they might, I might have got asked if I've spoken to him, but it'd be like, so what, like, you know, what went wrong kind of thing. And yeah. I think, you know, that's, it's a totally refreshing way of, yeah, way yeah. of working. So how, yeah. how did that manifest itself then? So I, I thought you were going a different way when you sort of went down the path of telling us that story that it was going to be a negative story, but how did that, so positively how how did that sort of manifest itself in the way that safety was managed when you were there how how, how was it different oh like you know the way that people would look, have expected stuff to be done how it how was, is it different in real it life was, it was very um so they they were probably more they were far 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 more far further ahead in in sort of their health and safety culture if you like because they had their culture was very much founded on on sort of respect and trust and integrity. Um, so, and it, and it was really uncomfortable for the health and safety team in the UK initially because it was completely alien to the point where, you know, everything that we did from a health and safety perspective was always analysed, you know, what's the purpose, what's the benefit? And if it didn't have a purpose or a benefit, it was sort of pulled. And we were all like, well, hang on a minute, we've got this massive, great big environmental health um sort of department in local authorities that are going to come in and they're going to ask for all this documentation and they're like well but if we spent more time on being proactive and stopping the incidents from happening and, and enabling our team to manage the risk at store level better themselves then we won't need to worry about the enforcement side of things and i was like do you know what that's that's absolutely that's absolutely what we should be doing um, and it and it was incredible. Um, it, it it was a challenge at first to get to get some of the business um, sort of bought into a newer a newer way of doing things. And unfortunately, it didn't last very long because Bunnings ended up selling home base and, and sort of just going back to to Australia. So the the journey was cut short somewhat. But you know, just working with you know some of the the the, the, the safety manager at the time and, and Benny who worked at, um worked alongside me in sort of a senior safety advisor role was just incredible just to see 
um, a, a completely different and almost more human side to health and safety because it was very much about the people, not necessarily about having the paperwork and having the checklist signed and the inspections signed and all that kind of stuff. It was all about safety leadership and empowering employees to manage risk locally based on the leadership principles that they had in place. Um, and that that sort of trickled out over time throughout the stores. Don't get me wrong, it, there was a bit of hesitancy at first, um, but yeah. then it, and short, unfortunately it was short-lived because they um, they didn't hang around for long. So in so in reality, did that mean so policies, safe working practices, uh, risk assessments, all that sort of stuff, were they just a lot slim? Like, did you have them still? Like, how, still did, had them. how did that sort of stuff work? Yeah, still still had them, but they were they were nowhere near as 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 sort of complicated and burdensome as you would expect to see. In, in the UK at the time. Um, so some of the safe, work, safe working practices were a page. Some of the, the health and safety arrangements and standards were a page. It was literally, this is what, this is the standard. This is what we expect to do. And this is how you do it. Really simple, straightforward. And I've, I and people who work with me now will know that I've taken that forward. So a lot of the work that I do with organizations is I go in and I streamline their health and safety management system by cutting out a lot of the stuff that's not adding benefit. And a lot of that stuff I learned my, uh, when I was uh, when I was with them. Sounds like a transformational sort of journey that you're on with them at the time. Yeah, it was. It was. And I'm, um, I'm I went there to get experience and exposure to the culture. And I'm I'm so glad I did because it it's it kind of showed me how health and safety can be empowering and can actually assist in operational efficiencies rather than the. You know, me and you will come across this quite regularly. That health and safety is just an obstacle. It's just for a tape. It's just bureaucratic. It doesn't need to be. There are better ways that you can do it, and and that's that's that kind of showed me how it was done. Yeah, amazing. No, that's uh, absolutely fascinating, mate. Absolutely fascinating. So, um, what else? What else did you prepare when I said to you, right, we're going to do culture, and we're going to do about uh, influencing culture? What 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 else are you prepped for, me? What else? So did you I, think about? I. I went at it from a slightly different angle because culture is such a broad range um, of, of topics. You know, um, the, the, for those that are interested in it and want to get kind of in, into it, James Reason's safety culture model. I've noted that down to me, so I wanted to make sure I got that right. That's normally a good sort of pool of resources. And, and basically, he's got can loads of... Can you send of, me a link? Is there, is there a link or something for that that I can put in the show notes? There is, mate. I can I can email you a link. There's loads of stuff on it on, on, on the internet. But basically, he has loads of little cultures within the safety culture, you know, a learning culture, a flexible culture, an informed culture. And I think understanding some of those elements would help people kind of understand that bigger that, that bigger picture of safety culture. But what what I did a bit of research on was some of the pitfalls that people can fall into because I don't know about you, Pete. When when I go into organizations, I sit down with the director or, or the, the operations director and they're like, we want a better safety culture. I'm like, cool. Is that it? And they're like, yeah, we just want a better safety culture. I'm like, okay, well, but, but what does that look like? What, what what do you mean you want a better safety culture um and uh, and uh th that then transcends into loads of little pitfalls and, I, and i've i've been falling foul of these um uh myself so there was a couple of things and i know you do half a dozen things so i think i've got six i may Amazing. have got i may have only got five but i'll, I'll try and think of one as a as i go through it um, go for it mate go on then. so some of the pitfalls um don't understand the problem they're trying to fix so that's oh, the first yeah, one. that's a good one. That's the first one. Is the you, you, you're an organisation? You sat around the table and you go, right, we're going to improve the safety culture, but they don't really understand what problem they're trying to they're trying to improve. And the the best one to use for to to our, um to sort of articulate this or provide a bit of context is accident and incident reporting. So I'll go into an organisation. This is just me speaking hypothetically, and they'll say we've got a problem because people aren't. Are, People aren't reporting accidents and incidents. Okay. Why aren't they reporting accidents and incidents? Oh, well, because, because they're not. Okay, it's a bit of a short-handed answer there. It's not really a lot to work with, so we need to dive deeper. 
And when you go out and speak to the, the, the guys and gals on the shop floor or the cold flows for out on the road or wherever they might be, um, you say to them, why aren't you reporting accident incidents? Oh, because we don't know how. You know, I, I, particularly in your industry, you know, you're in the depot, you load your van and then you're gone for like 10 hours. You know, there's no, there's no facility for them to report the accident incidents. When they come back in to drop the van off or whatever they're going to do back at base, do you really think they're going to hang around to report an accident before they go home? No. So actually, it's not that they're not reporting accidents. It's just that we've not given them the means to or we've not told them how to. Or there's a bit of a fear culture in the organisation that if they report the accident, they're going to get their hands slipped. So it's it's trying to understand the problem um, before, you, before you fix it. Because if you don't understand the problem, the chances are solution isn't going to fix it. Yeah. Makes total sense. Makes total sense. Um, second one, you don't pro you don't provide the resources to do it. So again, you can sort of lean this into into the, the accident incident one as well. You know, if you if you're not if you're wanting to encourage people to to report accidents, you need to provide them with the facility to do that, and you need the resources to pay for it. And I I, I say to a lot of um, a lot of organisations, sort of be careful what you wish for, because if you want an open and honest, transparent organization which i encourage i think that's i think that's absolutely the right way to go you need to have the resources and the facilities in place to listen to all that open and honest and transparent information coming your way and the resources to be able to deal with it i've i've worked at organizations before where we've had right we want we want shit loads of near misses right okay not sure why but let's go for it um by july we've got like ten thousand near misses and i'm like what are we supposed to do with all that information? Because there's only four of us and there's no way in a million years we're going to be able to fix everything that they've reported. So if, you, if you're going to push something to sort of help with the overall culture agenda, make sure you've got the resources and the structure in there to be able to manage it. Because if you haven't and it falls down, it's very, very easy, very, very difficult, sorry, to pick that back up. Yeah. Right, so that's two. So we're not doing two yeah. so far. Mate, you're smashing it. That's fantastic. Three, yeah. Lack of lack of leadership commitment. Oh, talk to me about that. So it's very it's easy it's easy to say, isn't it? I, I, I well, again, I'm speaking sort of hypothetically because I've never experienced it myself. But you know, we're in, we're in a boardroom meeting and 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 the leadership are all right. We want to we want a positive health and safety culture, or we want a proactive health and safety culture. But then they're not sort of visible in their commitment to that culture that, that you're pushing. Um, and again, you know, I've seen it in my experience where we've tried to push that open and honest culture. Um, and, you know, the, we, we've empowered employees to make decisions themselves because they're the, they're the experts, aren't they? They're the ones that are interacting with the risk. You know, we want you to be empowered to make these decisions. Cool. Well, that's unsafe. I'm not going to do it. Yes, you are. Or you're going to lose your job. Right. OK, there goes there goes that one. OK, um, and, I, and I've gone in on a Monday morning after a weekend and, and a couple of guys have, have collared me and they've gone. We had a We had a really un, unsafe delivery turn up in a container at the weekend. I'm like, cool. Is it still there? Should we go and have a look? And I'm like, no, we got told to unload it by the gaffer. Oh, right. OK, uh, so. And again, I guess this is a little bit of be careful what you ask for, because if you're going to work, if you're going to empower people to make decisions, if they make that decision, you have got to back them. Because if you don't back them, that that sort of visible leadership is going to then impinge on whatever you're trying to do from a culture perspective. Um, yeah. yeah. And I don't know whether you you probably experienced that in, in your travels, particularly in the transport all, industry. All, all the time, mate. All the time. So, you know, what can we do to become you know what can we do to become more safe and i think the challenge in our sector is it's always about productivity and where as soon as productivity and reducing productivity due to making something safer uh comes in that's when the the rubber's hit rubber hits the road when it comes to leadership decision making yeah it does yeah and and i i, I feel for that being stuck in that argument and it's really easy as a consultant now because we can sort of throw throw those things in from a distance but you know when you've got that operational need that productivity 
against health and safety it's always a fine line isn't it and you're trying to find that happy medium and i have seen cases where we've given we've tried to implement the empowerment of the employees and you can manage your risk and you can make calls and we'll back you and they've just taken the piss they've yeah. just they've just completely taken it out of context and you're like well okay i, I sort of feel for the leaders here because they're trying the best and they've they're, they're, they're involving you in the work and yeah. you're you're able to make your decisions but then the decisions you're making is showing that actually you, you're sort of abusing it a little bit. So that yeah, this yeah. is a bit of abusing the power. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does come. It does come from both sides, and it, it's very difficult to make um, to to have that argument between productivity and safety. They they are never well. They will get on, but sometimes they fall out, don't they? Um, it yeah. is it is a challenge. Um, so what we got to so we had, well, don't understand the problem they're trying to fix, don't provide resources, lack of leadership commit commitment. Four, four is sort of two prong. There's like four A and a four B, but I'm going to say four and five for, for sake. Um, and this is all about feedback. So okay. you can't, I'm sort of sticking my head above the parapet here. The safety fraternity are going to come after me next week. Um, oh, you, God. Baying mob, a baying mob. Yeah, with, I know. Like, I'm going to come, I'm gonna come and hide out of your offices, Pete, so no one can find me. Um, Pitchforks, yeah. Come, for, come. Yeah, welcome anytime, mate. They see. So, so a lot of the time, we try to do, we try to do safety to people. We try to do culture to people, um, not really sort of involving them in the in the problem. And these these sort of last three kind of resonate around the the people the the employees so the first one is we don't ask for feedback um or we don't we don't we, so we we don't provide any facility for feedback now if you're trying to make change or you're trying to do something different then then you need to be really open and honest with yourselves that not everything's going to work first time you've almost got to be really comfortable with making mistakes or doing things that people don't necessarily sort of align to. Now, if you if we go right back to what we're talking about, a culture, it's a collection of beliefs, perce um, perceptions, visions, values. Not everybody's going to have the same um, perceptions. And so there are going to be things that stick really well, and there are going to be things that are going to be a bit bumpy. If you don't ask for feedback and you continually push things out that doesn't align with the perceptions and the belief as, beliefs and values of your employees, it's not going to work because they're just going to get turned off and they're not going to do anything. So I think asking for feedback is really, really, really important. But sometimes I think as an organisation, we can be scared of it because we don't we don't really want to know what that feedback is. And, and sort Makes of to sense. caveat that is when we do receive feedback, make sure you do something with it. There is nothing worse. And, you know, filling out a form, sending it in and it just falls on deaf ears. It goes nowhere. Because again, that's, you know, you've, that's not part of your culture. If you're trying to build on it, if it's about being open, honest and transparent, you know, a learning culture where we see events as an opportunity to, to, an opportunity to improve. If we're not doing anything with the feedback we're getting internally, then surely that culture has then been affected. Um, yeah. And again, you, you see that a lot. And I use my case, you know, 10,000 near misses. I can't go back to every one of those employees that's reported those near misses. And so the, the 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 system's fundamentally flawed. Yeah, absolutely. It's um it, it you you've just resonated with the conversation I had with one of my mentees. So one of the things I do additionally is do I do a bit of mentoring with sort of new managers, new new line managers, regardless of what their role is, but just as they're starting to understand managing people and and uh and, and that kind of thing. And um I see uh, one of my chaps on a monthly basis and uh, I've been encouraging him to communicate more openly with his team of uh, team of engineers. And uh, I was like, oh, how did you meet him? And he was like, really good, yeah. And I was like, did they get stuff off their chest? He was like, oh, yeah, they're really open and honest with me. We had some feedback about uniform and PPE and we had a conversation around the communication from the office and uh, all of that. And I was like, oh, right, do you really understand what their problem is with with, uh, with what's been happening? Yeah, yeah, I really do understand the problem. And I was like, right, fantastic. Okay, cool. Tell me about what's going to happen at the next meeting then. And he was like, well, I was going to kind of do a similar thing. And I was like, right, what do you think you should start with at the next meeting? 
uh, 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 I was like, what about giving them feedback on all the things you've done on what they told you in the last meeting? Yeah. <laughs> and and preferably feeding back to them before the next meeting all the things you're doing about what they've told you. It's like, oh, I hadn't really thought about it like that. And I was like, yeah, 100%. If you want people to stay open with you, you've got to keep, yeah. keep acting on all the information you're getting and making sure you do something with it. And sometimes it might be, we're not going to action that for this reason, or we can't action that for this reason, but you've got to give people the feedback. Yeah. You can't do everything, can you? You can't do everything, but you've got to have a go. And that's and that and a large part of that I think is is like what I said earlier about just be careful what you wish for, be careful what you ask for, mm. because you know we're we're psychological safety is this is this sort of massive buzzword in in, in safety at the moment. Um, but I think I think you, organizations have done it in a in a different guise before, but they've created this open and honest environment. Um, they've got all this information flood through, but they've not really anticipated it and then didn't, then done nothing with it. As long as there's no reprise or um, you know negative attachment to it, then I think it's in goodwill and good intention. But if you are going to ask for feedback, make sure you've got the resources and the structure to, to facilitate it because people will stop giving it eventually because they know that it's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they, they, they've come disenfranchised with the whole yeah. process. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very good, mate. Very good. So five and six. You got five and six left. I've got. So that was that was four and five. So um, oh, okay. so four yeah. four was four was make sure you've got you're asking for feedback and five was do something with the feedback. I've sort of cheated yeah. there because I know they're probably no, one and the same. And then no. six six is involve the employees. Love it. They, they are the experts from a health and safety context. And I always say this on my training courses, your employees, your workforce are the experts. They are the ones interacting with the risk. They do that job day in and day out. Um, they know the challenges, they know the pitfalls, they know the strengths, they know the weaknesses. They, to a certain degree, will probably understand the culture of the organisation better than, than you will because yeah. they're, they're in it every, every day. Um, and again, I, I work with organisations or have done in the past where um i have done it with in my consultancy where they've they've developed these visions and values and then i've done some safety leadership workshops and i'm like so tell me what the visions and values are and they're like eh what <laughs> all right okay so uh so you don't know your vision and values uh no okay right so uh so where do you think safety fits in the vision and values and they're like yeah, not sure, not sure on that one either. So, and again, it's all that sort. Of, you you can't, you know, visions and values are personal, aren't you? Again, they're they're your beliefs and their opinions. So, if you if you're wanting to create them for your for your business, then you've you've got to involve the people that it's going to affect and it's going to the people that are going to be living it on a day day daily basis. Um, and that that will be said for for culture, whether it's safety culture or business culture involve your employees um, they, they will come with a plethora of information and this will work and that won't work and you need to you need to sort of get them on board because that will have a massive impact at implementation stage yeah absolutely i think um that that's probably the biggest but well, in fact that's the all six of massive shortfalls that i've come across but do you know what like they're really simple six really simple things really six simple pitfalls but actually just talking them through with you that loads has resonated with me and i know that the listeners will have the same like it will really resonate with them because they're all stuff that's the stuff that's happening day in yeah. day out within within different organizations so that's and there will be more mate. there will be more they're they're just ones that i've sort of been experienced or exposed to in in my time so you know unfortunately there will be more but they're they're the ones that resonate with me and and will be the ones that i try and sort of get ahead of as my business grows and I have vision and values and employees come on board because um you know they're the ones that I've I've been involved in or experienced before. Have you got a vision and values for your business yet? I've got I've got one I've got some values that I developed myself um but I'm very very conscious that I will need to revisit that once I start bringing employees on board because again it's not about me it's about um it's about them. Yeah absolutely when's the first hire coming? Uh, hopefully this time next year. Okay, so you got the roadmap. Yeah, love it, mate. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, the pro roadmap's primary... probably not too dissimilar to yours, Pig. To be honest. Yeah. Although your uh, 
you're you're you know you're you're leaps and bounds ahead of me, mate. Oh mate, no. It's all it's all just a front, mate. It's all just a front. Smoke oh, BA. <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. So modest. <laughs> uh, it like you said earlier, you know you said earlier about it's really hard um being positive about yourself. Same problem. You're the same. Yeah. Same problem. People all listen and go, fuck off, Pete, you massive big head. Genuinely, I find it really hard. It is a really hard thing. You know, when people like say your automatic default position, people go, I think it's like they're going really well. Yeah, it's okay, thanks. You just want to play it down. You just yeah, don't yeah. want, you know, you hear the bags, bags has got the smoke alarm going off. Dinner's ready. Dinner's ready. <laughs> Which is ideal, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely ideal. Um, Mate, so is it, it's a perfect time because now the dog starts howling as well. So one of the dogs howls at the at the alarm. Yeah, the Can alarm. you hear it? Can you actually hear it? No, I can't hear it, no. Can you not? Okay, well, that's good for the listeners at least. You'll hear the dog howling in a minute. Funny. Right, mate, it's a really good time because we've been about an hour, which is what we yeah. anticipated. I've been 20 minutes more of your time due to me being late, so apologies for that. That's right. Um, but, but we've been about an hour. And, mate, do you know what? Great insights. Thank you very much for sharing them. Um, if the listeners want to get in touch, if they want like some safety training, some consultancy, that kind of thing, and obviously they don't want to speak to me about it, then like, who do they speak to? Tell me, like, how do people link up with you? And tell us a bit. No, t- I'll tell you what, additionally, tell us a bit about the Health and Safety Network as well, mate, because that's obviously brand new too. Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, I'll do me first. So um, you can mm. reach me on LinkedIn, um, Sam Neal or Orchard Safety's page. Um, have a um, uh, look at the website, so www.orchardsafety.co.uk or, or just drop us an email, sam at orchardsafety.co.uk and I'll be uh, yeah more than happy to chat things through. Yeah, nice, mate. And whereabouts in the world are you based? You said before it's in Derbyshire, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm I'm on the I'm I'm on the Derbyshire Leicestershire border, um, so East Midlands, um, just outside Ashby. Um, so East Midlands, sort of West Midlands, is my perfect sort of patch. But we do I do work with organisations throughout the UK. Yeah, fantastic, mate. And just tell people a little bit about the Health and Safety Network as well, mate. Yeah, the Health and Safety Network. So it's it's something that I'm I'm newly a part of. Um, so those that have, I'm not sure if you've mentioned it before on here, but it used to be Project Miletium. It's now moved across to the Health and Safety Network. And, and it's um, it's a community for thriving health and safety professionals that that want, uh, want an area, an environment where they can be challenged. Um, they can challenge, they have a voice, um, and they've got an opportunity to grow. We do four um, community calls a month, um, community, um, sorry, four calls a month. Two of those are community calls. We have a philosophy call where we've got a, a, a guy, Simon, that comes on and poses a, a question and then blows everybody's mind. Um, and then we do a skills call as well where we're going to start touching upon sort of technical and cultural skills and how professionals can use those back in their, back in their workplaces. So, um, again, if, if anybody wants any more information, you can reach out to me, um, Colin Nottage, um, who is a, is a director, and or James McPherson. Perfect. And people, people listening who are avid listeners will recognise those names because they've they've been on the podcast too, mate. So, yeah, yeah, good to refer back to those ones, Uh, mate. Fantastic. And like, what a great asset this is going to be when people ask about culture. Obviously, we had a load of waffle at the beginning and stuff, but like, (laughs) literally, like when people want to understand about safety and culture and the pitfalls, what a great asset, mate. Fantastic, isn't it? No, hopefully it helps. Hopefully it helps people, and and you can use it in any. Uh, in any facet you know you don't necessarily have to be a safety professional in my opinion yeah fantastic mate thank you uh for joining me mate and uh everyone who's listened thank you for staying part of it and uh, i'll see you all on the next one thank you cheers mate i really hope you loved today's episode and if you did please make sure you subscribe and listen out for future episodes too please do share it across your social media channels we hope to reach more and help more people If you want to find out more about me, my name's Pete Rushmer. You'll find me across any social media channel and my business, Flagship Partners. And we're your partners in success across your business. Thank you. See you again soon.